uh, before we start or? Yeah, the video camera should stay. Yes. I mean, I think it's okay. Uh, okay, so I'm not, uh, I will start to broadcast now. Always, would that be fine? Yeah, I already started the countdown. Okay. We have attendees, maybe, maybe you can write on the chat, where are you from? So at least we get to know our uh, people. It will be nice to know where people are joining us. I see that we have already few attendees. If I type, if I type, you, you see me, no? I mean, when I type on the chat, right? Do you see my message? I'm speaking to myself. No. Hi there. Uh, this is Rick here. Uh, yes, I can see you. I can see your message. Great. Yes. So the, our attendees already in the room, right? Yeah, the attendees are coming in. Um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for attending. We'll starting. We'll be starting the event in two minutes. Um, as Nir mentioned, yeah, please mention where you guys are from and where you're watching from. Yeah, I see we have few people are already attending. So don't be shy. You don't have to show your face. Just you can write where are you from. So at least we know if we are global or we are local. We also have people viewing on Facebook Live. So yeah, let us know where you're watching from, guys. The Facebook, I will monitor later. So maybe you can write on the comments. Okay, I see more, more people are joining. Um, I guess we will have more people joining slowly, no? Well, slowly trickle in.
All right. Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. So let's wait a few more minutes. Um, we're waiting for more attendees to fill the room and also to watch us or catch us on Facebook Live. Um, and as, as Nir mentioned, Thank you for joining, Lorenz. Where are you? Where are you joining us today? Can you guys see my screen? Okay, Makati, great. So we have people from Madrid, we have people from uh, Manila, we have Eileen from Singapore, and the rest I will need to guess. We have Japan, hey Japan. Um, and we have San Francisco. Okay, ah, you moved from San Francisco. Hope you find it uh, exciting. When I was in Manila, I loved it. Such a vibrant city. And Kotao was a great host. So, Morioka, Morioka city in Japan. I still haven't been there, but I will check on the map. Where is it later? So at least I know how, how connected and how small the world is. All right, I think we're good to start. Um, you guys, um, thank you for attending. Um, thank you for taking the time this afternoon to attend uh, our second online Tech Shape talk, which is about the artistic mindset for professionals um, with our speaker near Hindi and moderated by Eiling Lim. I'm Paolo Rentero, a co-founder of Tech Shape. Um, just a bit about Tech Shape before we start. It is a media company or started out as a media company we found it around three four years ago um i founded this company with kotaro and another co-founder her name's fatima um we were looking for a solution um for the lack of information for startups in the philippines and we decided to start with TechShake, the website but since then we've expanded to other types of um, activities such as our um, innovation conference, which we do every year. So we've done the Ignite Innovation Conference for three years now. Um, due to the circumstances that we're facing, for this year, we'll, we'll also be doing the Ignite Conference online at around October or November. And beyond our events, we also do different other, other activities that encompass the startup, startup world. So like um, corporate innovation, uh, we do also do pitch competitions and like what we're doing now, the online Tech Shape Talks. So to start the event, um, I'd like to also remind people that you can ask questions um, during the talk itself. Uh, if you have any questions, please post it on Slido. Um, we discourage um, on having them on Zoom so that we can consolidate them on one question platform. So all you have to do is go to slido.com type the room name, uh, then ask your questions there. Uh, we'd, we'd appreciate if you'd put a format to it, which is name, company, then the question. So please use the QR code to open it up or type in your questions during the talk and then we'll have him, we'll, we'll ha answer them happily um, during the event itself. Okay, so to start off, I want to introduce um, our moderator for today. Her name is Eileen Lim. And she's the Singapore lead for innovation and partnerships for 500 startups. Uh, Eileen, uh, you want to take it um, so you can um, introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks very much, Paolo. Uh, so hi, everyone. Really honored and really glad to be here today. So at five, uh, Paolo, can you change the next slide? Yeah. Yep. So at 500 startups, um, 
I work with corporates to actually drive growth and solve business challenges through innovation. We help them build entrepreneurship capabilities internally. We help them enable partnerships with startups. And we really help them set up outcome-driven innovation initiatives. But the second part of my life is actually the Smarter Me life. So I'm also a founder and educator. At Smarter Me, we equip kids with the skill set, the mindset, and the heart set to actually design a future that they desire. So what really connects the two of my lives, right? I think ultimately it both involves changing a fixed mindset and nurturing a growth mindset, which is why I'm so excited to be able to moderate today's session on the artistic mindset. Thank you very much, Paolo, and over to you, Neil. Thank you, Yining. Um, to also um, introduce our next founder, his name is Neil Indy, and he's um, calling in from Madrid. He's a founder of the RTN, which is an innovation and creativity training-based company that looks for the best, in, in best practices and techniques for businesses that fuses art along with it. So to introduce himself and also to start the talk in, in, in its entirety, I want to turn it over to Nir. Hello? Yeah, sorry. No, no, I'm here. Watch, 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 watch. Jessica, um, near. I think you're muted. Awesome. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> Not to handle it. <laughs> it's okay. Chat. All the videos and uh, making sure that I'm. Uh, I'm uh, non-muted. Okay, sorry guys. Um, first of all, good morning uh, from Madrid. Good afternoon uh, in uh, Asia. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, TechCheck team for inviting me and uh, obviously for Ealing for taking the time to chat with me and do all this preparation. Uh, before I kind of uh, start, maybe you want to grab a pen and paper. I will mention some uh, ideas, some companies, some books, so you can actually check them out later on. Um, one of the things that it's nice about Zoom is that we can connect from all around the world, but what is weird for me now is that I only see Ealing. And even though we have a um, Few people over here, it will be great if you can turn on your uh, video camera. It's not a must, but will be great if you can just play along. Um, make sure that you are uh, unmuted uh, because sometimes we have this kind of dis disturbance. Yeah. Um, as you can imagine, we are social, so feel free to mention us on uh, Instagram, on Twitter, uh, and even Facebook. And with that, I want to tell you a story about me and how I got to do what I do. So I think this uh, story, this uh, image kind of represents my relationship with the world of art, okay? Um, that's a painting uh, by uh, Van Gogh. I guess uh, some of you have uh, encountered this painting, saw it maybe in real life, called uh, Sunflower by Van Gogh. And I always say that that's kind of the first memory that I have from the world of art. Because when I was a kid, and I guess that just like some of you, or maybe all of you, you did creative stuff, what we like to call. Maybe you built, maybe you painted, maybe you uh, ruined stuff just to rebuild it, etc. And one of the creative things I did as a kid is actually a, a join a painting course. And the final project of my painting course was copy this painting. And I still remember, remember it vividly because after that, I kind of neglected art for many ways. And while I grew up, while I, grew up I had this uh, kind of a challenge because I had big passion for art and design, art and uh, uh, architecture. But in the same time, I also had like big passion for entrepreneurship and business. And I don't know about uh, the school you went or the society you grew up, but in my society and in my school, everyone told me I have to choose. Either I'm creative, either I'm analytic, either I study painting, either I study physics, and they even, you know, gave us to do all those tests 
They tell you what are you good at, if you are good at painting or you are good at analytical thinking, and this is what you should study in life. And as a teenager that need to do these tests and choose, I had a hard time. Um, and while growing up, in, I mean, after I started my bachelor, I, I started in, the, in economics and web technologies. And I got to know a lot of entrepreneurs in my professional circle and a lot of artists in my social circle. And the more I got to know them, the more I saw that there are similarities between those two groups. And I was interested, how can it be that they are not talking? So I started to research it. And I think one day, one, one of the things that uh, um, helped, me, helped me start to conceptualize my idea is a one article that I read. And the message of the article was that entrepreneurs are the artists of the business world. And for many things, for many aspects, I cannot even uh, uh, stress why, why I think this uh, sentence is so strong. Uh, and I think that what conceptualizes or what defines most of the society is that many of us need to choose. And I have a hard time with choosing, why we need to choose when we can actually combine things. So to tell you briefly about like, uh, my professional background, my name is Niren, I'm originally from uh, Israel. Um, and I've been in the entrepreneurial ecosystem for uh, basically all my life. Um, I never had the chance to work in organizations. Most of the time I worked with organizations when starting my own companies. And today I'm the founder of the Artian, which I defined it as transdisciplinary training company. Basically what we are trying to do is to bring ways of thinking, methods, ideas from the world of art, combine them with the world of entrepreneurship in order to get new knowledge. And if we are talking already on, on creativity and art, I always give a visual explanation to what I do. Most of the business world design, as you see on the left of your screen, as a left brain structure. It's built on structure, on linear thinking, on methods, on processes, and often they try to force creative thinking. But the organization is not designed to absorb this way of thinking. That's why often it fails. What we believe organizations need to do is to develop it from within. And the reason that I do it, because all the tools are known. I mean, I always say you don't need me to come and tell you what you should do when it comes to innovation. But when, if all the tools are known, but still we are struggling, maybe it's not about the tools. Maybe it's about the way we think. So today, beside the Artian, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, startup uh, mentoring and coaching, um, and, and I do it in uh, Endeavor and MIT and Startup Bootcamp, etc. And from all those experiences, as I, I think that in my profile, I connect what I call the art mindset, the imagination, the curiosity, the futuristic uh, uh, thinking, with the business entrepreneurship of execution, of creating the next thing, the big thing, in order to bring this new knowledge. Now, I often been asked what, what is this uh, art and how it, it relates to business. And before that, I want to kind of tell you the common perception of art. If I would ask you now, sitting in your homes or your offices or I don't know where you are, to draw me a butterfly, most likely most of you will be reluctant because you cannot draw maybe this beautiful butterfly. So many of you will think about this butterfly. And this is the common perception that we have about art. Art should be beautiful painting, and because I don't know how to draw, therefore I'm not creative. And if I'm not, don't know how to draw, if I'm not creative, art is not for me. But I guess that some of you went to a museum and saw this type of paintings and ask yourself, what is this painting? I can paint it. My, my three years old uh, uh, kids can paint it. Why it's considered art? And when you see this maybe drawing, you say, okay, this is, a draw this is someone who knows how to paint. This is an artist. But between the two brothers, Jackson Pollock and Charles Pollock, the one that stayed in the history of art, is Jackson Pollock because he's the one that reinvented 
a different way to paint, a different way to experience art, a different way to communicate feeling. And Jackson Pollock is not alone. There is another a, a beautiful uh, example, and it's this drawing. And this drawing was painted by a 13 years old kid in Spain. And this kid was trained by his father and his father was a very traditionalist in art and he told him how things should be in art and he told him how he should draw and he told his aspiration for his kid was that he will be an art teacher in the academy. And you might know this kid because this kid was a bit relentless when he's come to a, a art um, and his name is Picasso. And Picasso, you, you, have you shown this picture, yes or no? I don't know, but many of you know Picasso for this type of painting. The cubism, the one that reinvented, the, again, the way we experience art. Probably one of the biggest shifts in art since the High Renaissance. And when, when you uh, hear Picasso, you see that Picasso kind of speak about it, and he kind of uh, uh, summarized it nicely. It took me four years to paint like Raphael, this great master of the Renaissance, but a lifetime to paint like a child. And those two examples bring me to the first realization that I ever had around art. Often, we tend to think about art as the object, this beautiful butterfly, or this painting, the religious painting that uh, someone can paint beautifully. But one of the things that I realized is that art is not an object. Art is not this painting, it is not the book, it is not uh, the song, and it is not uh, the movie. Art is a mindset. It's a way of thinking. And it's a very innovative way of thinking because it's a way of thinking that teaches you to look at the world, observe it, ask questions, and offer alternatives. It's an attitude that you live by. And if you want to think about how I perceive art mindset, I always use a metaphor for it. I want you to think about the tree. Often when you walk in the park, you look up to the trees and you say, wow, such a beautiful tree, so high, so massive, so, you know, so green. But the trees is what we see at the surface. And this is what I call the, 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 this is my metaphor for art. When you look at the tree, often you don't look at the roots. You don't look about what makes the tree, the tree. And for me, this is the difference between the artistic, the art as an object, and the art is a mindset. The mindset are those roots that allow to, the, to this aesthetic physical object to actually uh, uh, be, be alive in this world. Um, so this is kind of my, uh, my uh, uh, short introduction. And from now on, we will going to have it, hopefully also with you, much more interactive with Q questions, etc. So, healing, I think yeah. now it's... Uh... <laughs> Thanks very much, Nir. And um, so really, you know, we've heard your story, very eye-opening, very enlightening philosophy and advice on artistic mindset, looking at it as a mindset instead of an object. And, you know, personally, it resonates with me on two notes, right? The first one is that growing up, I love art. I used to paint a lot, but I still do as an adult. But I can totally understand what you mean. And especially in this <laughs> Asian world, none of us would be blessed by our parents to go and pursue art. Um, in today's context, it's a little bit better because you do have you know, UI, UX designers, but in the past, my parents would tell me that, well, you can't make money by being an artist. Uh, so it was always left as a hobby, right? Um, and secondly, I currently run Smarter Me, which is an edutech startup where we're trying to equip kids with this creative thinking mindset, problem-solving mindset as well. But before we dive really deep into that, I'd like to take a step back and really hear your story. Um, you shared about Van Gogh's Sunflower, right? But can you tell me about your why? I mean, how does art play in your life? What makes you love art? I think to, for you to even show us all this art examples, uh, again, resonates with me, but I don't believe that you have come up with this if not because you had experiences and have like a personal love for art. So share with us a little bit more about that, you know, your why. So it's funny because often people ask this question and the first people that ask why art is my parents. 
they don't understand where did it come from because most of the time when people see someone that uh, in the arts, so they think about their environment. Maybe their parents are uh, art collectors or maybe their parents are artists or maybe there was a, a cousin or an aunt that were in the world of art and they kind of encouraged the kid to pursue it. In my case, it was none. It was just passion. I felt inside that, you know, art interests me. Um, it's kind of, you know, something that reflect so many things that I feel. I mean, one of the things I recommend people to do is to imagine this a, a, a period we are living in. Now I want you to fire, think about yourself in your home, in quarantine for 60 days, and now I'm taking from you books, songs, movies, uh, the ability to paint, nothing. And I think that when, when you think about that way, you understand that art in many ways is something that we do naturally. That's what we did in the caves 20 or 30 years ago, a uh, thousand years ago. So for me, it was kind of a passion. And why I, I, I stress it, because often people think that, oh, my parents are not uh, relates to art. I don't have any connection, so I cannot engage with art. And in my own humble opinion, it's a misconception. And I started to go by museum, by museum by myself. I started to educate myself. And later, I used to start to meet artists. And then, you know, just come to them in the exhibition. Oh, wow, I love your uh, exhibition and your art. Would you mind to have a coffee? They don't know me, but many of them were happy to have a coffee and just chat about their art. And this is how I learned about, uh, about art. And the thing is that, you know, uh, I, I studied dual, dual, uh, dual uh, degree, uh, two, uh, dual major, sorry, in economics and web technologies. So super into the numbers, the SPSS and all the, you know, Excels, et cetera, et cetera. But I was also required to take like electives. And this is how I started. I took art history and I started to build it. So for me, it was kind of internal passion that led me to be curious about it and then want to learn about it and slowly developing my knowledge in, in this context. Thanks so much, Nir, for sharing that background. Now, uh, again, you know, I think we've talked a lot about artists and artistic mindset. Can you tell me if there are actually specific traits that, you know, artists have? Um, there are many, by the way. <laughs> there is a, a, actually a great book that I can uh, show later in uh, the Q&A. Uh, so I'll tell you what is this art mindset, uh, for me at least. I think it's kind of a, a collective of attitudes, of behaviors, of skills, of way of thinking. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, I think that artists are natural curious. It's curious, it's artists often what they do, not only that they look inside, they also look outside and they are curious about the world, curious about the social justice, curious about technologies, curious about materials, and they try to experiment with that because art is developed together with the, with the technology. If there is a new paint, if there's a new type of technology, if there is a, a new uh, a material, you will see artists playing with that to try to uh, kind of uh, get something. They don't know what, and that's what beautiful I think about also about one of the things that artists are, uh, are doing. They are natural explorers. They don't have a plan. They are not necessarily planning to go from A to B. They go from A. Where it will get them, they don't know. And I think it's a beautiful, um, in many way, approach to life. And in my own humble opinion, it's also the approach we need to take when it comes to innovation. You cannot plan where you want to go in many ways. You cannot decide, I want this. Because then it's, it's confined into the certain uh, possibilities that you are you're already familiar with. Um, so curiosity is very strong uh, behavior, I would say, that artists have. Their ability to kind of be natural explorer, we can define it maybe as a part of a mindset that they are willing to go to the unknown. And then what happens when you go to the unknown? 
you are able to take risk. The moment you go to the unknown, you say, I want to try something that someone else didn't. And the moment you go to the unknown, you invite this risk. And with this, this risk come also a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. And artists are very good at dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity. And I think that art as an object now, not only as a mindset, often if you think about the contemporary art, is very vague. Often we don't understand it. There is so many interpretations that we can bring into it. So we are not sure. That's why, you know, sometimes you see people in a gallery, they look at a, at a, a painting that they don't understand and they will leave after 20 sec seconds because maybe they don't feel comfortable. So, you know, it's kind of this curiosity, exploration, and with this exploration, the ability to take risk, their ability to be a, a vulnerable, because you know, you, are, you go to the unknown, you take risk, most likely you will also fail. And artists understand that part of the process is failing. You know, I'm just reading now the, uh, uh, the story of uh, Picasso and how he came to paint Mademoiselle de Avignon. It's very easy for us to admire Picasso as we know him. But if you read how Picasso uh, started, he was struggling. He was three times he went to Paris and came back to Barcelona because he couldn't make it. He didn't even have the, the money to eat. So it's very easy to look at Picasso, the one that re reinvented the, the, the world of art, but we need to also think about what are the sacrifices that Picasso did in order to be in that position. Um, and obviously, you know, I think that I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring you also the, the behaviors and, and, and later we can talk about specifically about skills uh, that I think also relevant for us in the, the world, in the business world. Because if you think about it also, artists are, are also the type of people that experiment a lot. They try different things. And as I said, you know, it's like experimentation requires ability to contain maybe a, a failure, to deal with it, to look at it differently. So, so yeah, I mean, for me, this mindset is a set of attitude, set of behavior, set of skills, set of way of thinking. So I just talked with you some of the behaviors and characteristics, and later I can elaborate much more about some of the skills that I think every business professional should acquire if they want to stay relevant in a job market. So I don't know, it probably was a long answer to a short no. question. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Nir. I think you outlined a lot of this like key mindsets, right? What it is. And, you know, I, just hearing you talk about it, I can totally see how that will apply for startups and entrepreneurs. And in fact, when you talk about experiments as well, um, Eric Ries just has a book called The Startup Way, which really is all talking about, you know, creating low fast, creating experiments, test out assumptions. Now, the thing is, when you apply it to like a corporate setup, right? Um, and we work with a lot of corporate innovators. Now, unfortunately, a corporate setup is one where everything has to be linked to ROIs. Everything has to be linked to tangible outcomes. And oftentimes, you would have corporate innovators in a corporate who really wants to innovate, who really wants to work with startups. But they still have to, you know, at, um, convince senior management, for example, by showing some form of outcomes. Can you help me and also help us, you know, some of the us in the audiences actually think about implementation. So do you have any real world examples of how someone working in a company have implemented this artistic mindset and actually achieved clear results? Yes, um, I, I, I can share with you a few things, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, let me kind of skip uh, quickly to some of the things that I, I want to show you. But before I, get, I will give kind of an example, um, I want people to understand one thing. In the business world, we often look for action, reaction. Put A, get B. Put A, black, get whatever. I don't know. And I think that business, it's part of life. And in life, you don't have only going up, you know? It's much more messy than that. It's much more kind of, I would say, uh, um, open, okay? And why I say it's important because when you come to approach 
in innovation, in creativity, in art mindset, it's not about action reaction. It's about an attitude to try things. Some of them definitely will fail. Some of them maybe will have part success. Some of them will invent the next thing, okay? So I don't want people to think that what I'm suggesting that art is the ultimate solution to all the business problem. And if there is one business professional that think, uh, think that way, it's naive because I don't think that there is one thing that can solve all the business problem. Business is like a live organism. It consists of so many things that not only one thing can save it. It's a, an attitude. Um, with that, I will give you some example of what, uh, what I think that art can do when it comes to the, to the organization, okay? And I think that one of the, the things that uh, think about yourself as, an, as a human, forget about as employee, as a human, I would assume that what you would like to do is to wake up in the morning, hopefully with a smile on your face and go and, go and do something that you are passionate about. Because most of us uh, uh, spend almost two thirds of our life in the work environment. So you want to come to a place that you feel respected, that you, your ideas are con uh, uh, taken into consideration, that you are being treated as someone that know how to think and not just, this is the task, just do it. And making you like a humanistic robot. And when you look at organizations, most of them have problem with the employee engagement. And the research show that you have on, on corporates on average, 13% of the employees actively disengage. Those are people that have miserable experiences at work. On the other hand, you have 34% that are very engaged. And in the middle, you have 53% that are not engaged. And those are people that basically doing the minimum. They may be satisfied with their job, but the moment they will get better proposal, they are going to leave you. So every business manager have two thirds of his, his or her company don't want to work for them. Now, art is about self-expression. And you have research studies that show that art in the workplace can actually uh, contribute to uh, employee satisfaction. Now, I don't want people to think about when I say art in the workplace, meaning just to put a nice uh, image, because that's the object. I want to give you an example of a friend of mine that worked in a satellite company, okay? So he worked in Planet, which is a satellite company that uh, based in uh, San Francisco. And the number 25 employee in the company, and you work with startup, you know what does it mean that in a, the 25th employee is actually a painter when everyone is a satellite and rocket engineers. He was hired to actually paint those satellites. But one of the things that he did, he pushed the culture of the uh, company forward. And he used to organize um, events for the employees. And he did it with their kids. And he created a, a family bond. Most of the business managers tell us, tell us, our company, we are a family. How exactly? What Forrest, my friend, did over here, he actually brought it into the company. And when I visited them in San Francisco, you felt the energy in the air. People were like, I, visit, I came there at around, I don't know, eight, nine o'clock at night. People were there playing music, you know, all those satellites, rocket engineers. And so, you know, it's like, you cannot decide that if you put one artwork, you will get 20% of uh, employee satisfaction. You need to create an environment. And that, then I don't need to tell every business manager what, engagement and employee satisfaction do for the business results. But to give you another example, um, General Electric in the US, okay? They opened an artist in residence program and they brought uh, one artist, okay, to work with them. And this artist together with the General Electric uh, team actually developed a new product for the, for the company. So it's, Again, it's not action-reaction. 
They didn't know that when they will uh, bring this, uh, um, this uh, artist into the organization, they will get a product. But they were willing to explore it. So if I go back to summarize your question, it can be intrigued in different layers. It can be by creating a, a, a great environment. It can be by a, building a strong a culture. And it can be by developing products. So there is no one thing. Art can be part of many great things. Thanks very much, Nir. Let's dive in a little bit deeper, right? Um, so I hear what you're saying about really using an artistic mindset um, to really enable the creative juices to flow. And when creative juices flow, people are more engaged, employee satisfaction increases and all that good stuff. Um, again, let's draw it back to really implementation of an artistic mindset in a corporate, right? In terms of achieving business results, because nowadays everyone talks about innovation and how we can, you know, um, use new innovation, use technology and all in order to solve existing business challenges, right? Uh, we, we spoke about this before and let's try and paint the scenario and I want for, like, the audience to start thinking about it, right? So now in this current scenario, the, the current situation, the current pandemic, uh, hospitality and tourism is one of the hardest hit uh, industry. If we think a hotel and entertainment chain right now who is hit hard by the pandemic, how do you think this artistic mindset can actually help senior leadership teams uh, prepare for recovery? Listen, it's a very, very, very difficult <laughs> question. Um, you know, one of my uh, closest friends, she's actually the innovation uh, a tourism manager for the UN, and I see uh, all the things that they are struggling. Um, so I don't want to talk about solutions. I want to talk approach because I don't have the solution. I, I can give yeah. ideas what they are doing. Again, I think that let's, I, I'll try to talk about it from different things, okay? One, okay. I don't think that the hotel manager that now will bring an artist will solve the problem. Okay? Because it's an approach. You don't plant a seed and in the same day I hope it will be a tree. You need to make sure that the employees in your organization are able to think that way. Okay? That's what I told you, action, reaction. But what I think artists, um, artists could have bring, for example, for this industry, what is a tourism? Tourism, it's all about the emotions. You want to have a memorable uh, experience with your experience. family. You want to have, exactly. It's about experiences. Now, what artists are doing? Artists are not selling you a product. Artist, artists are not product oriented. They are experience oriented. And I'm part of few uh, Facebook groups of artists. And it's interesting and amazing to think because if you think about it, art is very, in many ways, is a physical thing like tourism. But if you, I, I, now I'm following a lot of what artists are doing, it's very interesting to see the models that they are coming with to experience art. From the obvious of a virtual uh, uh, AR uh, reality, uh, realities to a collective of uh, Zoom music bands. So the approach is different. And I think that in this industry that is based on experiences, Obviously, not everything can be transferred to online or not everything can be a, a help on opening an hotel. But I think that a different approach is required. Not the cost cutting is important, mm -hmm. but how much you can cost, you can cut the cost until you don't have anything to, to produce. So you have two type of people, people that think about the cost and people that think about the opportunities. I prefer to see people in the opportunities and I think that art mindset works in opportunities because what is, what is the things that make entrepreneurs and artists similar? Both of them operate in context of chance, context of opportunities and possibilities. So they don't look about what we don't have. They look about what we have now, how we can work with that. And this is the approach. 
And I think it's a method of approach. Thanks, Nir. Um, now, you know, we've talked about what the artistic mindset is all about, but just sharing a little bit, you know, when we talk about skill set and mindset, right, there is always the debate around nurture versus nature. Uh, in Asia, for example, I dare say that, you know, the education system creates very high performance, very process oriented kind of workers. Uh, but relative to say, you know, Finland or Israel, I think it doesn't celebrate creativity and doesn't celebrate risk taking. So now culturally, I think our unconscious default setting is already different, right? We are more risk averse. Uh, but, you know, there is this commencement uh, speech that you shared with me you know, by David Foster Wallace where he said that, you know, we as humans, we can actually gain control and choose how and what to think. Uh, so my question to you is actually two things. Um, and, and maybe let's break this up, right? Because what I'm really curious about is that for adults, let's focus on adults first. How can we gain back control and choose how we can think and what to think? Um, how can we choose to nurture this artistic mindset, you know, in adult? Because like, we're, we're all, you know, as much as we talk about lifelong learning, um, let's share a little bit more concrete steps in order to take that approach. And before you answer that, to the audience, please, please go over to Slido, pop in questions there. We want to make sure that you take the most out of this session uh, and you leave feeling that, you know, you've learned something and you're ready to apply something. So please go over to Slido and pop in your questions there. So Nair, over to you. Um, so I want to I wanna start with, you remember what I said about, I don't know how to draw, therefore I'm not creative, therefore art is not for me. I want to show our listeners something, okay? Um, so they, there is a very, very famous research that try to understand creativity among kids. And they develop what they call the creative genius, okay? And what they saw is that majority of kids between the age of three to five, they have 98% of creative genius. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? You go to school. school. And what happened in school? The school system today was designed in 1790 for the industrial age. What we needed in the industrial age? Performers. People that know how to be efficient, know how to move A to B, people that know how to uh, uh, just execute the, the results, etc. But the education system of 1790 doesn't fit the education system that we need in 2020. The world today is much more complex. The world today is much more connected. The world today is multicultural. The world today requires fast thinking, creative thinking that we need, but we still, what we learn in the education system, the most important thing in class is to come up with the right answer. It's never about the question. So the education system trained us not to ask questions, come up with answer. I ask you uh, what you should do uh, with this uh, equation, that's the result. And obviously, the moment you think that way, what happened? It reduces even more. And because the business work environment was designed the same way, so what you get at the end, the moment you enter into the job environment, is that by the end you are 25, you are, le you are left with 2% of creative genius. So what is the message for me to people over here? It's in, inside you. Now, obviously that not everyone is Leonardo da Vinci. Not everyone is the Jackson Pollock or Picasso. But I believe that all of us have a certain level of creativity. And what, and what you will see is that the research, again, shows that only 30% of creativity can be associated with genes. It means that 70% it's nurturing it. Now, what I recommend adults to do, close your eyes. And I want you to think what happened if you get 20 or $50 million in your bank account? What are you going to do? Are you still going to do reports in Excel? Most likely, most of the people you will see talk about creation of stuff. They want to learn how to cook. They want to learn whatever. What I encourage people is to close their eyes and ask themselves, if they had this situation, what would they do? So, and then start to pursue what we call hobbies. 
With, in our world today, everything is so efficient that even your hobby need to serve your business function. So people don't allow themselves to explore. So the best, if, if you have kids, do it with the kids. If you don't know how to do it, they will push you. You need to do it. So you go outside of your comfort zone and start to do things you are not comfortable with. And then ask yourself, what I was aspiring, what I aspire to do if I had all the money in the world? And slowly you start to try. Now, it's not that you come and uh, or you say, okay, I want to learn how to be uns uh, deal with uncertainty, so I will start to paint. Start to paint, and then you will learn how to deal with uncertainty. Because when you will start to paint, for example, you stand in front of a white canvas. So what do you do when you stand in front of the white canvas? You deal with uncertainty. And if you want, I can give you examples for concrete skills that I think people need when it comes to this uh, art mindset. And obviously, I you know, I mean, obviously uh, we, we don't have the time, but to talk about why it's even more important in artificial intelligence, but let's talk about the, the skills, okay? Yeah. Most of the time, when you look at these skills, most of the time you will see that those are the skills that you, you see on job uh, requirements. People that know how to empathize with customers, people that know how to stay focused, people that understand experience, they are open-minded, but all of this come from the arts. Not only from the arts, don't get me wrong. Not only from the arts, but many of, of this come from arts. Because empathy in the business world, most likely you are doing everything through emails, through uh, uh, calls. You don't have the opportunity to practice empathy, but art is all about empathy. And as we discussed before, artists are experience oriented, not necessarily product oriented. And obviously when you create art among, and you are uh, sensitive to humans, you need to be open-minded. So there are many skills that come from the arts and, and uh, or behaviors that come from the arts and relevant for business. But I want to speak about the one that's relevant to, for, for innovation. Okay? And um, the thing about innovation, I want to show you something that I see the business world perceiving. And the moment I realized we have problem with innovation is when I saw a shop in Colombia that call itself innovation. And then what you see is that most of the organization are, I don't know why it doesn't move, yeah. Um, one second. Yeah, so the, when you have a store call itself innovation and every company is innovative and every company has innovative culture, etc. But innovation in the business world really is often, you see this, managers tell you, I expect all, my, all of you, my employees to be independent, innovative, critical thinking, they do exactly what I say. That's why you get this in the business world. You have the innovation killer org chart. You have the chief idea killer, the VP of no, VP of status quo, everything to prevent innovation. Because innovation is like, you know, the zombies. Be aware of zombies. Now replace the word zombies with creative. What do you hear? All oh, these creative people, ignore them. They don't know what they are talking about. They don't understand business. So everything is going against it. And that's a shame because as I told you, as we just talked, everything is inside the organization. Now, what I recommend people to do when it comes to this, uh, uh, some of those skills that are uh, relevant, um, and, and you are involved in startup and innovation, so you already know, and we discussed it the other day, the first thing we are required to do is to go outside and observe our clients, observe how they behave, observe how they interact. And from this observation, we are supposed to get the insights. But what's interesting about observation is that we think about observation as something taken for granted. I have eyes, so I see. But it doesn't work that way. Observation is an active process. So we need to move from passive looking to active seeing. And most of us, where did you ever have? Did you ever had the chance, sorry, to have observation class in school? or observation time in the job environment? Most likely not. So we don't train our eyes to observe. But think about what is art. And if I put this image on the screen, 
Some of the people will tell me that the figure in uh, pink is a male. Some of them will tell me it's a female. Some of them will tell me the people are arguing. Some of them will tell me the people are discussing. And you are actually need to look with intention. And after you actually observe, what you need to do is you need to question what you observe. Why my customers behave the way they behave? Why they use the product the way they use? And what did we just discuss a few minutes ago? You learned that questions are not, are not uh, uh, common because you are afraid to be sound like stupid. My approach for everyone, I always start the conversation. Guys, I'm an idiot. That's why I ask a lot of questions, if you don't mind. But this is my way to understand, even though I understand many of the things. And it's often need to kind of shift to what is, to what if. And you can see it in art. What if actually photography captured the reality better than my, my, my painting skills? So what if I can create a different experience in art? And you saw it in business or technology, nobody thought that bringing back a rocket is actually possible until SpaceX did it. So after you question what you observe, you actually need to offer alternatives. Now, what is the thing about ideation? What did I ask you the other day? How often do we do ideation workshop? Maybe once, twice a year. But ideation is a muscle. The economist research showed that in order for a company to get 100 projects, they need to have 3,000. So there is a certain quantity and quality related. But from one or two hours a, a year, you are not going to get original ideas. But what artists are doing? They sit in front of a canvas and a blank paper every day. And they need to come up with ideas all the time for a new things. So they are trained for it. And then comes the association from disciplinary to multidisciplinary. And we are obviously, we, in a world we are living, there is so much knowledge that you cannot control everything. So you need to have specialists. But we also need to for, remember that we need to create the, the interaction with other disciplines. Science and art, technology and uh, whatever, farming, whatever. So if I, if I were to give a recipe, for example, not, not a recipe, I don't want to call it. Please, I'm taking my words back. I don't think there is someone that stand over here can, can tell you there is a recipe for it. I can tell you what I do. One of the things that I do is that I observe art a lot. You can do it online, you can do it offline. Go one hour, one hour a month with a notebook and write objectively what do you see. Over a course of a year, you can improve your observation skill by 20, 30%. Ask better questions. Ask more questions that are open-ended. What if? Why not? Let's assume we have all the budget in the world. What can happen? Come up with ideas every day. Not once a year in the company retreat. Write 20 ideas how artificial intelligence will influence your job. Write 20 ideas um, what you can do uh, in order to have another uh, 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 side income. Write 20 lectures that you can give based on your experience. Write, I don't know, 30 uh, uh, disciplines that artificial intelligence might influence our lives. Whatever. Or come up with the, the same process of coming up with ideas, come with questions. 20 questions I can ask about the current business uh, firm, uh, business uh, situation, etc., etc., etc. So, I think I talked Thanks. too much. Huh? No, no, that was great. And I think um, just sharing that, you know, the specific skill set and also how to actually nurture it uh, takes us very nicely into the last segment of today, really. So let's move into Q&A. Uh, again, guys, the slider channel is still open. Um, you can post anonymously if you're not comfortable, so just ask away. Uh, but um, I'm going to start asking some of the questions. Some of this that you've answered before as well. But, you know, the first one is really, so how do we enhance our ability to think creatively? Um, like they say, coffee makes you more focused. Alcohol in moderation makes you more creative. So aside from spending, say, one hour a month observing art, is there anything else that you think, you know, is, uh, will enhance our creative mindset? 
So <clears throat> I'll tell you something. For me, creativity is kind of an osmosis uh, process. That's why I think I'm a lucky person. Most of my friends are artists. I make sure to surround myself with creative people. And the moment you are, if you work in finance and all your job environment, everything you read, everything you, is around finance, I'm not sure it's the most creative environment to be. So one thing that I recommend to people is to surround themselves with people that are creative. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to be your friends. You can do it just by listening to podcast by going to uh, talks, going to meet up, to meet ups uh, meeting, obviously with the corona, uh, we cannot, but it's just temporary situation. So in my opinion, what I try to do is always surround myself with those people. But in order to surround yourself with those people, and if you want to make them your friends, you need to be curious, but real curious. Wait, I want to learn about your profile. How did you get to do it? Wow, so interesting. Tell me more. So you need to be curious about life. I think it's, I think curiosity, as Robert Rauschenberg, one of my favorite painters uh, uh, said, curiosity is the, 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 the most important uh, 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 characteristic of a creative person because that's embark everything. You know, I always tell people, you know what is, one of, one of, what is my favorite uh, thing to do? Is to read books. But as much as I love books, you know what is the thing I hate the most? Is to read books. You know why? Because every word that I read in a book, every name, every phenomena, I go immediately to the internet and then I start to learn about it, and then I have another 10 books to read. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I have like a list of books that it's endless. So those are the two things I would recommend at least. I, can, I don't want to say. Be curious yeah. and look at creativity as a creative process and surround yourself with creative inspiration. Yeah, Th thanks for that. Like that, if I could just add on myself as well, right? I think it's important for you to figure out, think about a time when you felt most inspired and most excited. Uh, for some people, it's reading. I've got colleagues who say it's when they're working out. Some colleagues who say it's when they're traveling. Personally, I love listening to podcasts. Um, those are the times when I actually feel truly inspired and excited to bring some after that. The other thing that's really simple as well was something that was taught to me. Now, growing up, watching movies, I was never, no one ever asked me what I thought about the movie at the end of it. Uh, but that's actually one very easy way that you can just start, start thinking about it creatively. At the end of the movie or the book, why do you like it? Why do you not like it? What did it really, you know, fascinated you? Just train that muscle. And I really like that word that you use, muscle. Um, so moving on to the next question, really, right? It's about how do we use the artistic mindset for the digital transformation of corporates? Uh, any good example? And if you don't mind, Nair, while you are on that, I would actually like to take a step at that question because we talked about this earlier on a little bit as well, and you went into quite a bit of detail. Um, are you okay if I, I jump in there for a while? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's okay. I will just will say one thing. Digital transformation, it's not digital transformation, it's a culture transformation. And if it's a culture transformation, we need change in human behavior. And I think that just to kind of sum up what I said, we need to be able to build a culture that empathize with people that don't feel comfortable with the new change, that allow them to fail, that allow them to experiment, everything that we discussed before. This is what we need to bring. Not new technologies, new behaviors, how to use technology. Perfect, superbly well said. Um, so at Fire we always work with corporates on digital transformation. And the biggest, toughest problem that everyone has is actually really change mindset. Uh, but if I could just share, you know, how we've seen kind of it works, right? So there's two things. What Nerd shared about taking the step to go and observe and communicate both with your clients and your stakeholders, that's really a good way to jumpstart, to identify what are the problems and then brainstorm solutions, right? Just get creative, go out with like lots of quantity of ideas and stuff. Um, and then after that, what you can then do internally would be create small experiments. 
quick wins. That's why a lot of corporate innovators like to say, how can I create all these small experiments with very tangible quick wins so that I can then convince other people in the organization to also change, to also adopt innovation. Um, that's one. And just want to note that, you know, a lot of corporates start by having this like hackathons and stuff. And then they say, this doesn't go anywhere. What's wrong? What happened? We did a design thinking workshop. It did not yield any result. What happened? Um, again, I think change the mindset such that the first step to that is when you're in a really old or traditional organization, the first step really is to inspire. As we can tell today, you know, most people don't practice that creative, that, that artistic muscle. And so the first thing you want to do is to be able to inspire people and make them realize that, hey, actually, I have ideas as well. I can come up with ideas. And so where a hackathon or a design thinking workshop does well is that, that initial spark. But what happens after that, you definitely need to nurture and train that muscle and you need to create opportunities for them to um, continue pursuing that, right? You need to have that canvas for them to experiment on and again, uh, celebrate those small little failures or big failures even and celebrate risk taking. Yeah, totally. No. Okay. So this other question, I think this will be the last one for today, which is what's the best way to jumpstart? Uh, we kind of talked about this earlier, but what's the best way to jumpstart an artistic mindset from a personal individual starting point, especially if we feel that we are starting from zero? Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you something, and that's something I tell everyone. I didn't come to art because I thought it would make me a business professional. I didn't have this knowledge. I, was, I went to art because I was curious about it. Remember, curiosity is the, the thing I will go back all the time. Um, I was curious about it, and, uh, and I think that every... In my own opinion, every human being can find himself or herself in the art because art is about human reflection in many ways, about our emotions, etc. So what I did is that I, I learned the hard way for that matter. I went for a for a exhibition without knowing anything because I didn't have any knowledge about art. I asked myself, what do I see? What do I feel? And then I used to go back home and then read about the exhibition and then read about the artist and then go back again and see it in a new eyes. And then if it was on a gallery, so I wanted to check when they, there is a gallery talk with the artist and then I go to the gallery talk. And then just like I told you, hey, I'm near, nice to meet you. You know, I love your work. Do you mind to have a coffee? And this is how I got to, to get exposed to this way of thinking that allow me to also think about my own, my own uh, world and what I was doing. Because the nature of conversation, when you speak to someone like an artist that is different from you, is that they challenge you. So it makes you think about what you are doing. So for every individual, at, at least find the, find the artistic practice that speaks to you. For me, it's visual art. Some people will do, like, as you said, movies or literature. And then ask yourself, who are they, for example, who are innovative or who are innovatives in those fields? What can I learn from them? What talked to me? What, what inspired me, etc. So it, maybe, you know, it's actually a good, uh, I will take uh, advantage of your question to share with our, if I can share my screen, if you allow me for a second, I don't know who has the screen control. Ah, yeah, I will just want to share with our, uh, our uh, 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 participant. One of the things that I aim to do actually is to allow, uh, yeah, to allow, uh, let me take this because that's what I told you. Zoom requires so many skills. One of the things that uh, we aim to do is actually expose this way of thinking in our new podcast. And I encourage people to go to our uh, podcast. And over there, we are interviewing artists, business professionals, entrepreneurs, that all of them has one thing in common, relationship with, to art. And together with them, we ask them questions. What do you do to challenge yourself? How do you deal with, a, a, with a, a repetition in your work? How do you push yourself? And some of them are stud uh, teachers. How do you push your students to go outside of the comfort zone? So I will highly recommend people uh, to check this podcast because in our podcast, we try to channel it ex specifically to even this conversation. How art and artists or entrepreneurs that are related to art drive innovation with what they do. 
So by the way, those are, uh, this is my LinkedIn, feel free to reach out. Um, when you reach out, just please let me know that you uh, attended this talk, so at least I know where I saw you or where I met you. Hey, Nir, I can't actually see your screen. I'm not sure if you're sharing. Ah, no, I mean, ah, this, you didn't see this? Ah, sorry. I was talking, 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 and I didn't uh, share it. So, yes. sorry, my mistake. Here it is. This is our podcast, and this is uh, uh, my LinkedIn. If you contact uh, via LinkedIn, just let me know you attended this talk, so at least I know that um, we met at least virtually. Um, so this is, this is uh, uh, my part and we can uh, go, I wanted to uh, take advantages and help individuals that are interested to find some uh, ideas. And with that, I will give you the, the stage again. <laughs> Thank you for being kind with me. Thanks, Nir. Um, okay, so I think the last question we have is how is the ability to handle ambiguity? And let's skip this last session for today. Last question. What, how has the ability to handle ambiguity as an artist helped you in navigating the business environment? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's something that also relates to my entrepreneurship uh, background. So one of the things that you know uh, I, I, I had in the past is obviously challenges with the businesses. And just like I have uh, challenges with the businesses, artists have all the time in a survival mode, okay? You never know what, what's going to happen next year because you don't know if the exhibition will be successful, if your company will be successful, if people are going to like your art, people are going to like your product. So you learn to live in the day and to focus, how can I improve and do my best today so tomorrow I have a better lead. And you don't, in a way, you don't plan for the next 10 years. You plan to be excellent in the next week, and then in the week after, and then in the months after. And so, so, so this is one way I learned, but in the other way, I'll tell you something. My approach is to be proactive. So you have this ambiguity. But I always ask myself what I can do to deal with that and what I can do to be in the next step. Most of the people saying, wait, sitting and waiting. When you are an artist, when you are an entrepreneur, you don't have time to wait. You start today to do. So, and by the way, it doesn't mean that it's cutting off long-term thinking. Okay, it's very different between the long-term thinking to the long-term doing to, the, to what you need to do. I take the short things to do today because I have long-term thinking that I know where I wanna get. So I need to find the solution today to get to the next step that will bring me to the vision at the end. And I'll just kind of uh, summarize it with one th something to think about as we discussed, most of the great artists are not even creating art for us. They are creating it for the next generation. But they are working today to make it relevant for the next 50, 60, 70, 100 years. Thanks, Nir, for sharing all that. So, I mean, I'm just going to quickly recap before I hand the stage back to Paolo. So, I think today we talked about um, the artistic mindset, really. You know, you mentioned curiosity, being an explorer, risk-taking, uh, being comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty, and finally being really okay with failure. Um, you know, think about if you're in a corporate environment uh, or you're a manager, leader, think about using art to actually engage employees and to increase retention because, you know, when they are creative, they feel inspired, they tend to stick around for longer. Um, the third thing really is, you know, to think about how can you do it? Start small. Um, you know, take time out of your daily schedule. Observe art, observe movies, go mix around with people that you don't normally mix with. Read a book, listen to a podcast, listen to nearest podcast, uh, and just train that muscle of yours. And finally, I think the really fourth point is just be comfortable creating small experiments in wherever it is you are, whatever organization it is. Go out, observe people, communicate with them, and then create small experiments that you can try out. So with that, thank you very much, Nir, for your time, for spending all this and sharing all this knowledge with us. So I'm going to hand it back to Paolo. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Nir. That was a great talk. Um, I definitely learned something today. I usually encounter um, times wherein I would hit a plateau or feel like I'm hitting a wall. I think um, now that I understand or you've introduced me to the artistic mindset, I can really just start opening my mind and just letting go of like the, lo the logical, not necessarily logical, but you, that business, too much business part of my mind. And yeah, start observing people, start just talking to people, reading books and conversing with interesting people to maybe help me with those problems. So thank you, Nir. Thank you, Eileen. Um, before, um, and thank you for, to the audience for attending our um, talk today and for the people who asked questions. Um, just before we finish, um, I would want to talk about our next event um, on June 18. We're having a closed event for investors and corporations. Um, it's an online pitch session where we have startups pitch in front of a, a group of judges, uh, investor judges. Um, if you want to attend, please email either Rick or Kotaro. Um, you can see it on the slide now. And the focus on this event is the Vietnamese startup ecosystem. And so before we end, I just also want to ask um, Eileen and Nir if you have any other closing thoughts. Yeah. Well, for me, I always uh, say that if there's one thing I want people to remember is that art is not an object. It is a way of thinking and it's a very innovative one. And remember it, because we, I think we need two, both of them. We are so focused on developing our analytical thinking that we forget to develop our creative thinking and intuitive thinking. And at the end, the world consists of many things, not only one. Yeah, for me, anyone who wants to talk about corporate innovation, about startup scaling and expanding, um, hit me up on LinkedIn and you know, let's connect from there. I'm just going to borrow a quote from Nearest Background. I hope to meet you guys in real life soon. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending today. And hopefully we see you on the next event. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, wherever you are. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, Nir, Yiling. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending.